Today we're going to look at the final three rules to complete our study of natural deduction in propositional logic. Next time we'll add rules for the quantifiers to move on to natural deduction in predicate logic. Now, some of the rules that we're going to talk about today are very interesting because they determine different systems of logic. So at the end of today's video, we'll compare three different systems of logic, minimal logic, intuitionistic logic, and classical logic each of which is defined by the position they take with respect to the rules we're gonna talk about today. First for today, we have the repeat rule. This doesn't come up very often, but you will see it occasionally, and it is actually necessary in order to carry out some of the proofs we would want to carry out. Basically, the idea is if you have phi on line L1, then you can just write phi again on line L. Now, when applying this rule, the only thing to keep in mind is that you have to stay out of closed boxes. So if you've closed off a box, you can't use the repeat rule to repeat something that's inside a box, outside of a box. As simple as this rule is, it's unclear why anyone would ever need it. But we're gonna show some examples and you'll see that usually it's most useful as an aid or a helper in applying the rule for the introduction of the arrow. So here's an example. We wanna go from the premise Q to the conclusion P arrows Q. So obviously, since we're trying to conclude an arrow statement, we're going to need to use arrow introduction eventually. So we begin, like with any proof, by listing our premise as an assumption. Now, because we know we need to introduce an arrow, and P is the antecedent of the arrow that we want to introduce, we're going to then add an additional assumption, P, knowing that we're going to withdraw that assumption with the box later on. Notice what we've done here is we've simply applied the repeat rule on line one, and that's enough to get us what we wanted. Notice we've assumed P, and we've then derived Q on a following line. Well, that gives us enough to say the introduction of the arrow rule applies on lines two and three. We close off our box to discharge or withdraw these assumptions, and we have the conclusion that we were aiming towards. So again, the idea of the repeat rule is simply that we can repeat things that we already have at a later line, and you can see how this was how that rule was used here. And the intuition here is, look, if, if Q is true, if we're assuming Q is true, then introducing some new thing won't change the fact that, that Q is true. Q will still follow no matter what else we introduce. The next rule is EFSQ. EFSQ stands for ex falso sequitur quote libet. What that means is, from a contradiction, anything follows. So the rule can be simply pictured. If you have falsum on a line L1, then you can write psi on uh, a new line. And the rule being used here is EFSQ on line L1. Now it's important to point out that psi is an arbitrary proposition or an arbitrary formula. So again, the idea is from a contradiction, from a falsum, anything follows. You can choose anything you would like to follow from a contradiction. That's just what the EFSQ rule allows you to do. Later on, we'll talk a little bit about the philosophy behind that. First, we're going to give some examples of EFSQ in action. So we want to get to P arrows Q from our only premise being not P. The way to understand this is to start from the bottom. How do we get to, to P arrows Q? Well, we know we're gonna to need to get from P to Q inside a box, but now we've got a new tool for getting to the end of the box. Namely, just secure a falsum and then apply the EFSQ rule and we can get any proposition we want. In this case, we want Q, so that's the one we'll write. So starting from the top then, not P is our premise, so we list that as an assumption as always. We know that what we want is an arrow statement with P as the antecedent, so we list P as a new assumption. Then notice that gets us a contradiction right away. 
So we can list Folsom according to our elimination of negation rule on lines one and two. Well, from a Folsom, anything follows. That's just what our EFSQ rule says. So we have Q, which is what we wanted, and then we can close off our box and write P arrows Q with our introduction of the arrow on lines two through four. So a very powerful rule here. Here's a second example. Here's the idea. One of our premises is a disjunction. So we wanna to try to use the elimination of disjunction rule. How did that rule work? Well, remember, to eliminate a disjunction, you need to look at the two disjuncts, and then you need to get an arrow statement for each one where each disjunct is in the antecedent position of one of the arrow statements. So here we have phi or, or psi. So in order to eliminate the disjunction, we need one arrow statement with phi in the antecedent, and we need one arrow statement with psi in the antecedent, and then we need the same formula to be in the consequent of both of those arrow statements. So essentially what we need is an arrow statement P arrows Q and another arrow statement Q arrows Q. So in order to get P arrows Q, we start by listing P as an additional assumption, knowing that it's going to be closed off in a box eventually. Well, that helps us in a large way because now we can use our EFSQ rule. Here we have P and not P, so we can derive Folsom using our elimination of negation rule on lines two and three. Well, since we have a Folsom, we can apply EFSQ to get Q. That shows that we have if P, then Q. We draw our box around those assumptions and, and close those off. We'll never make use of them again. So we've got our P arrows Q arrow statement. Now we know we need to get Q arrows Q in order to apply the elimination of disjunction. So we're gonna start with Q as an assumption and we're gonna to try to derive Q from that. Well, that's easy enough. We can just use our repeat rule and then we're done. So we box off those assumptions and the following derivation. And we say that we've shown you, look, if you assume Q, then Q follows. So we have Q arrows Q using our introduction of the arrow rule on lines seven and eight. Well, now we've got the ingredients for our elimination of disjunction. We have P arrows Q on line six. It's not inside a box, so we can keep using it. And we have Q arrows Q on line nine. It's not inside a box, so we can keep using it. Well, we can use the, now we can use the elimination of disjunction rule to get Q all by itself.